Alright, uh, good morning and welcome. You are in class on Acts of the Apostles. Uh, if you thought that this was heroic dance, that is upstairs with Bob Jones. Uh, but today you're in uh, Acts of the Apostles. Uh, my name is Dustin Smith. You can call me Mr. Smith or, I don't know, hey you, my parents call me Ding Dong. I don't know, just, I'm not real big on titles, so it doesn't matter to me. Uh, and I'm going to be your guide through this, uh, this oft-neglected book. Okay? Um, I think the reason why the book of Acts is neglected is because it's not Jesus. It's not Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. We've got four accounts of the teachings of Jesus, and we like that because we learn those things. We learn them in Sunday school. There are a lot of sermons on the parables and, and the Sermon on the Mount and love your neighbor as yourself and the Great Commandment and the death and resurrection of Jesus. And, it, and, and the book of Acts is also not Paul in the sense it's not a letter. We've got 13 letters attributed to Paul. We've got letters of... Um, uh, uh, James and, and Jude and Peter and John. And it's not the book of Revelation, which people can't seem to agree on what the world that's talking about. Um, so it's it's kind of like we don't really know what to do with the book of Acts. It's kind of history, but let's just be honest. The church doesn't do much with the book of Acts. Would you all agree? Yeah, we, I think we, we it, it's that way because it's not any of those things. It's not a gospel. It's not one of these letters. And it's not the book of Revelation. Um, and so it just kind of gets left aside. Uh, and so there's a lot of, I'm going to say the word ignorance, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean it as in people just don't know what the book is saying. They just don't know that. So, um, so we're going to go through the book of Acts uh, in more detail than you ever care to want to know. But I will make sure you get your money's worth out of this. I, I, I teach three classes this semester. Okay, I teach Greek, I teach Acts, and I teach New Testament Survey. I spend 70% of my time preparing for this class. It's actually the smallest class that I have, okay? Um, because this is not an uh, it's not a uh, an elementary level class. You, I assume you all have taken some sort of a New Testament survey thus far, um, and so I assume you know some basic things already, and we won't uh, we won't we'll review some of those. But uh, we're going to build on top of them there, okay? But I want you to be able to understand the Book of Acts as best as possible. Okay, let's look really quickly at the, the syllabus here. Um, <clears throat> what do I want to say? Uh, course description, of course objectives. I just have to put those in there um, so you can read that on your own. Uh, required reading. Um, I give you a really, really, really good commentary for this class uh, by Fitzmeyer, Joseph Fitzmeyer. He is a top-notch scholar, and he is a, you'll be really surprised at how honest he is on what the text says. He, he will say what the text says even when it goes against his own tradition. Okay? Um, I actually had a, another particular commentary that I wanted to give. Apparently, it went out of print like the week before we started ordering things, so I gave you this one. You might find this commentary uh, is a little meaty, and you might have to work through it a little bit more, but that's okay. This is a good, solid, like scholarly commentary. This might be like the best one that you have purchased thus far. Dunk it. Oh, and you're going to back from Shred. Okay. All right, um, so, so you'll have that, that commentary there. Um, I'm going to give you various handouts and articles. Um, you'll get that little semester. Uh, I want you to bring to class the Bible, and don't bring your cell phone, and don't bring your, your laptop that has the Bible on it. I want you to bring a Bible to class, okay? It's really funny. I didn't bring mine. <laughs> You're like, got here really quickly. All right, that will be alleviated at the break. Nope, don't worry about it. Um, but uh, I prefer that you actually have a, a good literal translation. Uh, I'm going to be teaching that the New American Standard Version because after over a decade of reading Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic, I am convinced the New American Standard Version is the most literal translation. That's not my opinion. That's based on, like I said, over a decade of reading all three literal languages. Is that NASB? Yes. No, NASB. NASB. Okay. I don't know why some people call it NASB, but it, it's, it's always abbreviated as NASB, the American Standard Bible. Uh, if you have the New Revised Standard Version or the ESV, those are fine. Um, and uh, if, you, if you have taken some Greek, I, I really want you to be able to use, utilize that in class so you can bring your New Testament as well. Um, so that's um, point number four. And then I put there on number four, to whom much is given, much is required. That's a biblical statement that Jesus said. So if you've been given the knowledge of Greek, you need to take advantage of that in this class. So I'm encouraging you to use your resources in an important way. Yes, sir. No? Okay. Gotcha. If you get another translation, that's fine. Uh, you will find, though, that uh, translations other than those three are not going to be as honest with the text as the Greek 
would like it to be. Uh, but that's okay, that's fine. I don't want to uh, enforce that, but um, <clears throat> we'll, we will address those issues when they arise. Okay, um, if you were at orientation, they talked to you about the writing guidelines. Uh, I'm going to be a stickler on these writing guidelines because uh, most of your homework in this class is just going to be uh, writing a response paper every week. There are no quizzes. There's one tiny midterm and one tiny final, but every week the only thing that is due is that you have to write a response on what you think a passage says. That's it. Okay? But I want you to write it in good college writing form. Okay? So if you don't have the, the new updated writing guidelines, and I know they're new and updated because I updated them, <laughs> uh, please go up to the fourth floor of Classroom 1 and pick those up, or if you want, I'll email those to you. Okay? Um, on the very back, um, you see the grading. Um, with those basically 1,000 points, 30% uh, of your grade, it says engage participation and discussion, okay? If I'm the only person talking during the discussions, then you guys are losing out on your grade, okay? So I, I need you to come to class knowing what we're gonna talk about, having read, the, the, usually we go over two chapters a week, <clears throat> today we'll go over one chapter, and, and, and you know what? If, if, I want you to, uh, to, to you know, peruse the commentary, look into it, have an educated opinion on matters. Don't just tell me I think or I feel. Give me good reasons, okay? Let's be good, college-level, critical thinkers of the Bible that are going to work with the evidence and, and, and really make some good convincing arguments, okay? Let's work with the history. Let's do some word studies. Let's, let's have some fun here. Let's get into the meat of things, okay? This is not the kiddie pool anymore. This is the Olympics. Amen? Amen. All right. Um, you're going to have weekly response papers. That's 60% of your grade, okay? I want you to know that most of your grade is coming from you writing a response paper every week. And then you have a midterm and a final, which is they are 5% of your grade apiece. You see how much I really care about a midterm and final? I don't think that's the best way to teach you in a class like this. I don't think the best way is for me to give you a bunch of information and you to regurgitate it back to me because you'll forget that the next day. I'm more convinced in how can you make arguments? How are you going to look at the text? Uh, can you think critically? Can you look up information and commentaries and lexicons? Okay, I want to see. I want to see you grow in your critical thinking and, and your interpretive capacities in this class. Okay, I'm more concerned about that than whether you can quote to me Acts chapter eight verse twelve. Although Acts eight twelve is an important verse. Okay, so do you understand what, what what we're gonna do in this class? Okay, it's not about me feeding you a bunch of information that I want you to regurgitate back to me. It's about let's go through this book. Let's look at it from. Uh, a political perspective. Let's look at it from a literary perspective. Let's look at it from a theological perspective. Let's look at it from the perspective that Acts is the second volume of Luke's first volume, which is called Gospel. the Gospel of Luke. Okay, this is the second volume. It's like it's like part two. You know, it's like Empire Strikes Back. Okay, you got to you got to know the first story. All right, I got a Star Wars reference in there. The Book of Acts somehow. Okay, do you understand how grading works? Okay. So most of your grade is going to come from you writing these responses. Uh, actually, it, it, it almost comes out to where each response is equal to like your midterm. Like, so you see, like they're, they're pretty important. Please don't be late on them. Okay. Um, let's look at the, the, the course outline. It's still on the back, page two. Classes are going to be composed of lectures and exegesis. Students should come to class having already thoroughly read the assigned chapters so as to contribute to group discussions. That's thirty percent of your grade. In other words, a student can potentially fail the course for failing to actively engage and participate in these weekly discussions, okay? Part of your grade is talking to me. You know, so this is not a class for the shy people. All right. You asked for it. What? Did you asked for it. Yes, I did. Okay? All right. The textbook, which is the commentary, is intended to be periodically perused by the students in preparation for their individual contributions, okay? This book will give you more than you ever need to know about the book of Acts, okay? All right, point number two. Each week it is a, a short response paper is due on a topic which will be discussed in class. So like next week, if you look on the third page, you're going to see what is due on, for week two. What is due on week two? A paper that is on what topic? Is the message. Yeah, is the message of the kingdom preached in the, the sermon in Acts chapter two, okay? So in class next week, I'm going to talk about that subject. To prepare for that discussion, you are going to read the text, you're going to read the book of Acts, and you're going to read through the commentary there, and you're going to write and you're going to make up your mind, okay? Give me a position, argue it, yes or no, tell me why, okay? 
you know, I think there's a right or wrong answer, but I'm going to tell you there's no right or wrong answer. But I don't want you to agree with your roommate just because he's your roommate. If you think the evidence is going in a different direction, you write a paper based on what you think the evidence is saying. Okay? Don't give me a nice Sunday school answer. This is not Sunday school. This is, this is college. It's an advanced course here. Okay? So that's what we're going to do. All right? Um, I put the response paper should be comprehensive enough in length to adequately answer and address a specific assignment. What I'm basically saying is, I don't, I'm not going to say it needs to be one page or two page or three pages or 750 word. I don't care about that. Answer the argument. Like, answer the argument uh, effectively and succinctly. All right? Um, let's see. Uh, oh, the papers are due at the beginning of class. Print it out or they will receive a zero grade. Please underline that. I'm going to say that again. The papers are due at the beginning of class. Print it out or they will receive a zero grade. Please do not email them to me. That means that I have to go take my time and to print them out. Let us be responsible students. Print them out, bring them up here. If you, if you say, oh, I'll go print them out uh, at the break, that's a zero. Okay? They need to be given to me at 9.30 a.m. on Wednesday when the class starts. Are we all cool on that? Like, do we make sure we're all on the same page here? Okay. All right. Um, these assignments should be taken very seriously as they constitute 60% of your grade. They need to be within the writing of college writing guidelines. If you don't have a copy of those guidelines, please uh, look upstairs at those. Um, I said the midterm will be given on October 28th. We're covering basic facts, and I'll give you a review sheet so that as long as you study your review sheet, you will ace the, the midterm. And the final exam is going to be a take-home exam. Is that you take it home and you fill it out and you bring it back, okay? And a review sheet will be given for that as well, okay? This class is not going to be a, a difficult class. I don't care how much you know, I care how hard you want to work, okay? It's not about how smart you are, it's about how hard you want to work, okay? Um, and then if you want to make some bonus points, there's some, there's some comments on there. Any questions about the syllabus and about what this class um, is going to be comprised of? No? Anybody getting cold feet? How you guys feeling? You feel good? Okay. Let me tell you, the Book of Acts has all sorts of crazy action. There's a lot of neat stuff. Okay, now, what I like to do and teach is that I like to put all the information that you need to know up on PowerPoints, okay? I have something like 35 or 40 slides. You, your arm would die writing down everything that I'm telling you. So what I'm going to do for every class is that I'm going to provide for you um, the... Uh, the PowerPoint's there, okay? Everything that I'm going to give you, I've given you all the information. Because guess what? If I were to write all that out on the board, my hand would, would die too. And I had to get a mechanical arm just like Luke Skywalker, all right? Another Star Wars reference. Um, so, but here's the thing. I'm not going to take the time to print these out and bring them to class, okay? Some people, they don't like those. Some people are just going to take them and they're going to say that's nice and they're going to throw them away. Other people like these things, okay? If you want me to send these to you before class, so that you can go upstairs and print them out, or you can print them out on home, or you can bring your laptop or your tablet and you can have them in front of you. If you want them, email me before class, or tell me to email you, and I will email you the file. Okay? I don't have all of your emails right now. I'm sure if I dug around, I can figure them out. Okay? But it, here's the thing. If you want these PowerPoints from here on out, you didn't know today, but I gave them to you. But if you want them, let me know, and I will give them to you. If you don't want them, no big deal. That's fine. It, it costs a lot of ink to print all these things out. Okay? So, I'll make it available for you, but uh, if you don't get it, Book of Proverbs says you have not because you ask not. <clears throat> okay, any questions before we start going? All right, welcome to see you Let's go. Okay. Before we, get in, uh, before we actually start reading the Book of Acts, We've got to figure out what kind of literature is Acts, okay? This is the question of genre, the question of genre. Most, I don't want to say most, but many of the arguments about people that misunderstand passages in the Bible would really be settled if they stopped and they asked the question, what kind of genre is this literature, okay? When you open up a newspaper today, you go to the store, you go to QT, you pick up a newspaper, you're going to have a variety of literary genres in the newspaper. You're going to have the front page, which is just going to give you the facts. You know, just the facts, man. Okay? Then you're going to have the sports page, which back in the day, if you're a Atlanta Braves fan, it would say, you know, uh, you know, Chipper Jones saves the day at the final hour, meaning he hit, you know, a grand slam to bring them from behind the bottom of the ninth inning. Okay? And then you'll read the, the funnies, the comics. And that's a different kind of literature 
than, than the front page. It's a different kind of literature than, the, than the, the sports page. You'll have the editorials, which around this time you're going to have donkeys and elephants talking to each other about missing emails and about Donald Trump. Okay? Those are editorial cartoons, a different kind of literature. <clears throat> and you'll have the obituaries, which will also talk about different things. Okay? We don't read the front page, the sports page, the funny page, and the editorial the same way. We all know we're familiar with that type of literature that they're supposed to be read in different ways. Okay? Some reason, somehow, some high school teachers have thought that it's okay that you just teach people that you just read everything in the Bible literally unless it doesn't make sense, and then you read it figuratively. That is too naive a way to, to read the Bible, okay? We have to identify what kind of literature it is and then interpret it appropriately, okay? Because what if something is figurative? Because um, the book of Acts, or sorry, the book of Acts, so the book of Revelation um, talks about uh, uh, dragons with, with, uh, with something like ten heads and a bunch of horns. And you may think, oh, I need to interpret that literally. And you may think in your mind, Dungeons and Dragons or something. And some may say, come on, now obviously, that's supposed to be figurative. Well, if you understand that the book of Revelation is, is apocalyptic and it uses symbols to, to, uh, to get across its point, you understand that I should interpret it figuratively first, not literally first. So we need to understand the question of genre. Do you have a question, sir? Yeah. I don't I only have the, this one. I didn't get the second one. Oh, OK. I actually did not print out any for you because I had all this stuff printed out, actually. Uh, I had it all printed out yesterday. Uh, if you wait till the break, I can give you a copy of it. But, uh, That's fine. but I, just, I, I printed out just enough for everybody uh, like you. Um, did, he actually, did you actually get copies? I got three copies. Gotcha. OK. <clears throat> did everything make it around to you? OK. I mean, yeah. Do you mind giving him that one right there? Yeah. Actually, yeah, you have, you, you have both of this. No, I, I have one. I understand, but he, but he he's missing one and you're missing one. He has both of them. Mm -hmm. I'll, <clears throat> I'll, I'll, I'll sort all that out for break. But I have to go on here. Okay, anyway. <clears throat> um, what kind of literature is, okay, this is the question of genre. What kind of literature is Acts, okay? All right, so Acts appears to be the second of two volumes. I think a lot of people uh, forget this. It's called Luke Acts, okay? Luke wrote both of these. He wrote more of the New Testament uh, than anybody else, even when you put all of Paul's stuff together, okay? So, if Luke, the Gospel of Luke, is a Greco-Roman biography, meaning a biography of the ancient world, not biographies in the way that we understand biographies today, if Luke is a Greco-Roman biography with Christian features, this hints at the historical tendency for Acts. In other words, how do we understand what the book of Acts is? We know Acts is part of Luke Acts. It's part of uh, a two-volume work. If the book of Luke looks like uh, a Greco-Roman biography, which has historical tendencies, then it's likely the book of Acts uh, is understood as history. That's my argument there. All right. Acts seems to fit the genre of, I'm just going to put my cards on the table, of what is called ancient historiography. Okay, ancient historiography. Okay, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, they are Greco-Roman biographies. Um, you know, the letters of Paul, they are, uh, uh, they are uh, Greek epistles. But the book of Acts is called ancient historiography. That's my argument, okay? Although Luke nowhere hides the fact that he brings his Christian bias to the table when he writes Acts. Uh, and by the way, uh, ancient history writers also possess theological presuppositions, so he's not by himself with this, okay? So he's not just writing just the facts. He's writing the facts, but he's got a deliberate Christian message that he wants to teach, okay? And for the record, there's no such thing as people giving an unbiased opinion. We all have different things that are influencing our... Or per our perception. Okay. All right. We also, we also have this guy, um, uh, Polybius. He's a second century BCE Roman historian. So BC is before the Christian era. We would sometimes we say BC. Okay. He says this. He says it is only indeed by the study of the interconnection of all of the particular, their resemblance and their differences, that we are enabled to at least to make a general survey and thus derive both benefit and pleasure history. He thinks that after doing all the homework, that we can derive both benefit and pleasure from history. He says, you know, history can be fun. It can be exciting. It can be, you know, it can have lots, it can have drama in it. As you read Acts chapter 27, we've got this shipwreck, there's tons and tons of drama. Okay? It can be funny. 
He says it's possible that you can actually get benefit from it. You're not just reading a boring history book like you had it in grade school, okay? Anybody like history in grade school? Yeah. You guys are terrible. <laughs> you guys are sick. All right. So that's, that's what he's saying there. Okay. All right. Uh, Lucian. This is a second century CE orator. So he wrote in the second century. Uh, he, he has a book on called, called How to Write History. It's a great book. Okay. So he says this. How one could write history better. There are some who omit or deal, cu deal curiously with major or memorable events and lacking professionalism, so he disagrees with them. They spend ages on detailed and laborious descriptions of the most trivial things. Okay? So he said, this is not how you're supposed to do it. He said, these people are, are not the professionals. Okay? So, is, is, should we go to the Book of Acts and should we expect the minute detail on every possible event that are not really important if Luke is being professional? No, we shouldn't. He's saying that that's these are the people that are not professional. That's what they do. Okay? Lucian also suggests that when a historian describes a speech, okay, speeches, the book of Acts, okay, he says, it is most important that his language suits his character and his subject, and this also should be made as clear as possible. However, on these occasions, you are allowed to act as the orator and display your own oratical powers. <clears throat> And I write here that speeches, by the way, make up one-third of the book of Acts. One-third of the book of Acts are speeches. Peter giving a speech, Paul giving a speech, um, Roman uh, governors giving speeches, <clears throat> Jesus giving speeches. One-third of the book of Acts is speeches. And what he's saying here is that, you know what? If you as the writer, so consider Lucian writing to Luke. It's kind of ironic they have a similar name. He said, look, if, if you are going to be a history writer, you're going to write speeches, Okay? Um, you need to do your best to make sure this speech fits their character and their subject. He says, but on occasion, you are allowed to act as the orator and dis display your own radical powers. Uh, so oratorical, excuse me. Um, so it's possible that the speeches in the book of Acts, um, because they didn't have tape recorders, okay, and, and Luke is, is likely writing something in the 80s, you know, like 50 to you know, 50 years or less. Uh, from the, in the particular um, uh, uh, speeches, we see sometimes that Luke is going to be able to put things, he's going to organize them in his own words. Okay? We should not be surprised when this happens. Okay? And these speeches are obvious abbreviations. The speech in Acts chapter 2, which is a pretty long speech, is uh, Peter's Pentecost sermon. You could read that, that passage out loud in two minutes. Is that a speech today? Is a two minute speech a speech? No. It's obviously an abbreviation. Obviously, okay? So we need to understand when we read the book of Acts that since a third of the book of Acts is speeches, we need to understand that, you know what? It was acceptable in ancient historiography uh, for the writer to do the very best that he could to put them in that old person's words, to put it in the words of Peter or in the words of Paul. But it was acceptable on people who say how to write history that you could, you know, craft things in your own words, okay? That was an acceptable practice in that time period. Okay? That may not be acceptable today, but that's what was acceptable back then. Okay? We can't, and, and Luke, and see what I'm arguing is that Luke is writing history the way that everyone else is writing history. He's just writing it from the perspective of a Christian. Okay? That's just what they did. Okay, and we can actually see Luke's selectivity and freedom, which can be observed in Paul's conversion. Or, so in that Paul's conversion is described in three places. But all three places where Paul's uh, conversion is described, they're described slightly differently. Okay? So even Luke can be a little bit flexible, even in his own writings, when he's describing the exact same event. Okay? That tells us that as a, a writer of history, he had flexibility. And that's okay. That's fine. We can demonstrate that in the book. And one of your uh, assignments, actually, I think when we get to around chapter 9, um, one of your uh, writing assignments, you'll, you can see on the third page of your syllabus, it'll say compare and contrast all of these three so that you can see this for yourself. Okay? I need you to be able to see this. I'm not talking about a contradiction between Matthew and Luke. I'm talking about do we see differences even in their own writing. And Luke, if, if, if he wrote this all together by himself, which I think that he did, it seems likely that he, he is allowing for the flexibility that is acceptable in the writing of ancient historiography to be used there. And if we can demonstrate this even in one work, then you know what? We can relax a little bit. We can relax a little bit. Any questions about this thus far? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, 
does this challenge the issue of inspiration? Could it be said? Yeah, <clears throat> I, 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 inspiration is a, is a very uh, slippery word. Um, some people say inspiration, and I don't exactly know what they mean. Uh, do I think Luke was inspired by God to write the book of Acts as we had it? Absolutely, without reservation. Okay? Uh, but that's what I think inspiration means. I think there's a, a divine, a, a God presence that inspired Luke and, and, and gave him life and breath and the ability and the language to write down what we have today. But it was a combination of God's inspiration and influence and encouragement. Um, along with Luke being a human vessel through whom God's uh, uh, writing was there. I don't think, and this is what a lot of people think, God gave him the words to say. Like, like he just kind of was in a trance, and, his, and God took a hold of his hand, and he started writing it down, and he had no, no Luke wrote this down. He had sources. We see from the book, uh, beginning of the book of Luke that he checked his sources, he talked to people, he talked to eyewitnesses. We're going to see, uh, uh, once we get to chapter 24, that Luke uh, actually has... Um, official precedings from Roman governors that he's copying and pasting right there. So we see that Luke actually has done his homework. Does that answer the question there? Yes, sir. I don't know if I should ask this question right now, but uh, uh, talking about the, story, the, the freedom that he had yeah. writing this, to what purpose? For example, those perhaps different passages. Um, what, to what end would that would he have done that? I don't think it was deliberate. I don't think I don't think he's trying to make make an issue of it at all. It just shows that. Um, is, it, well, the interesting thing is that if I were to tell you the story of, of Paul's conversion, uh, he was walking, he saw the light, he fell down, and you know Jesus said, uh, Paul, Paul, or Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And and then of course he got up and then he, he you know he went to where to go Damascus. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's the basic part of the story. You can see that skeleton of the story in all three of the examples, okay? Now, all three of them are going to, you know, put maybe a couple of extra things on there, but that's the basic part of the story. Because in an oral culture, being able to tell the base part of the story was the most important part, okay? And you can see this when you study um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You can see that they, they had a, the gist of the story was the most important part, but you could change a couple of things. That's why we have... Um, the parable, we have parables in, uh, in Matthew chapter 25, and a parable, I think, in Luke 19, we have the, uh, the parable of the minas and the parable of the talents. It's the same parable, they use different words. It doesn't matter, because the whole point is someone is given something, and they need to, uh, they need to grow and to nurture that gift, and they're going to be called to account when Jesus returns. The, the particular name of it doesn't matter. It's, it's what is the sense of the story. And, and that's, 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 just, that's just there in the text. What we need to do is we need to say, how do we respond to what's there in the text? I can't argue with what Luke does. That's what he did. It. And, and, and he's the professional. I'm not professional. Okay. We're going to have to go a little quicker here. I, I may have given you way too much information for the first class. You have no idea how many pages I've read and how many hours I've spent just in this lecture. Okay, that's all right. All right, um, let's talk about the Apocryphal Acts, okay? If you uh, get a copy of what is called the New Testament Apocrypha, these are apocryphal books, books uh, written in the name of another person, uh, uh, dealing with the New Testament. These are works written in the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th century. Many of them are Gnostic works. They're written by people who have a Gnostic or a Gnosticism-type theology. Um, there are a lot of uh, Apocryphal Acts, okay? Like the Acts of Paul and Thecla, the Acts of Andrew, the Acts of John, the Acts of Peter. Let me settle this right now. Paul did not write the Acts of Paul and Thecla. Andrew did not write the Acts of Andrew. John did not write the Acts of John. And Peter did not write the Acts of Peter. No sensible scholar today thinks that they did. Okay? So the question is, we see these apocryphal Acts, and, and can we learn something about the book of Acts by studying these? That's a, a legitimate question. Okay? You know, we look at other literature, and what can we do? Okay, so we see the apocryphal Acts, they were actually read by some early Christians. Due to the similarities in style and language and theology and contents, they need to be examined as a group. And so I write that the Acts of Paul and Thecla, written in the late second and early third century, it has little real historical value. It talks about the life of Paul and someone named Thecla, who doesn't even show up in the New Testament. Okay? By the Acts of Andrew, which actually encourages ascetic practices and possesses Gnostic ideas. That sounds nothing like a book of Acts. Uh, number three, the Acts of John, written in the late third century, early fourth century. 
Um, it's likely come from a variety of authors, so it's not written by one person. Some of these people were Gnostic, some of them have a docetic theology, and some of them have a modalist theology. Modalism, Patrick. <laughs> Number four, you have the Acts of Peter, written at the end of the second century, and it depicts an ongoing struggle, struggle between Peter and this guy named Simon Magus, who actually shows up in Acts chapter 8, by the way. Okay? But, but there's no argument with them. Like, there's no extended argument. There's, there's, a, there's a small disagreement in the book of Acts. Um, but this whole thing talks about this. Basically, I say these works, they show influence for the book of Acts, as in the book of Acts has influenced them, but they possess more fictional aspects, which are really trendy. They're really popular in the second and third centuries uh, CE. And since the title of the Acts of the Apostles, this is interesting, the title Acts of the Apostles did not appear until the second century, I, my suggestion is that it's likely that it was given to the book of Acts in order to argue for its supremacy against these apocryphal acts. In other words, I think the book of Acts, when it was written, was not called the book of Acts. It was just Luke's second volume. In the second century, they said, this is the Acts of the Apostles to differentiate it from the Acts of Paul and Thecla, the Acts of Andrew, the Acts of John, and the Acts of Peter. Okay? I think that's a good, plausible historical reconstruction. Moving along. All right. How does the book of Acts use the Old Testament, and what does this tell us about its genre? All right. Acts cites the Hebrew Bible 35 times. That's a lot. That's a lot. Okay? And the successive reports of the church's progress, as we see how the church is described in the book of Acts, they resemble a pattern exhibited in the history depicted in the Deuteronomistic history. So you see the books of De Deuteronomy, um, Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, that sort of way of telling history seems like the way we see in the book of Acts. So it seems like Luke is, is drawing on the way the Old Testament describes its history. That's very interesting, okay? The Hebrew Bible's historical works use major speeches or editorial comments to introduce themes, to sum up themes, and to transition to the next unit, okay? So you'll see David giving a speech, or little summaries, or, or, or uh, Elijah giving speeches, or Elisha giving speeches. We see this in the book of Acts. Acts similarly utilizes its speeches um, and even its prayers. Okay? Uh, the Hebrew Bible's historical works also narrate through a series of main characters. They don't focus on every single person. They focus on main characters, like Moses, like Joshua, like various judges, like Saul and David and Solomon and various kings. It doesn't tell us everything. It tells you about the major figures. In the book of Acts, you basically have Peter, Paul, and, and a couple of small people. That's basically it. Is it I mean, a, a real question is, is the book of Acts really the Acts of all of the apostles? No, it's really not. It, 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 only, it only really talks about the major, like two of them. You hear a little bit about Philip. You hear a little bit about Stephen, who's not even really apostle. Um, but it's mainly like, let's tell you the story about Peter. Let's tell you the story about Paul. It's mostly about Paul. I mean, even the, even the title of the Acts of the Apostles is, is, is not even really a fair title. Let's just need to keep that in mind, okay? So Acts does the same thing, although primarily with Peter and Paul. Okay, how does it use the Old Testament? Let's talk about this a little bit more. The Hebrew Bible declares that God... Man, that's glitchy. All right. God is in control of history, no matter how sour it may seem at times. Okay, isn't that pretty clear? The Old Testament says God is in control, but man, things are, uh, you know, sometimes things are not going very well. The same is depicted in the book of Acts. Acts uses such phrases as God's counsel, God's will. It is necessary, kind of like the divine necessity. Okay? Um, it talks about how God, uh, we need to appoint in advance or we need to foreordain. It talks about the word predestined and foreseen. The whole point is that the book of Acts has this understanding, this presupposition that God is in control of history, okay? In the same way the Old Testament does. Even though things might not be looking very good, and anyone who goes to church knows very well that, yeah, God is in control, but man, human beings, they like to mess things up. Can I get an amen? Amen. I will apply an amen. All right. All right. Um, also, the author of Luke has been influenced uh, linguistically by the Septuagint. What is the Septuagint? That is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, started in the second century, uh, and, and, and likely had at least a full translation by the first century. Okay, and Luke is drawing from the Septuagint. Okay, His, uh, Luke's audience would be educated Greek-speaking Christians. They would be educated Greek-speaking Gentiles. Um, even if, if Theophilus, 
is a real person, which I think he is. It was, it was certainly understood that it wasn't intended to be read just like Theophilus. Theophilus was always going to share it with someone else. And obviously we're reading it today, 2,000 years later. All right, so in the question of genre, the fact that Acts has much in common with the Hebrew Bible, especially the historical sections, suggests that Luke intended to write history. That's the whole reason of me doing it. There's a lot of parallels to the Old Testament. The parallels are in the historical section that would seem to indicate that Luke was trying to write history. Do you have a question, sir? Oh, no, I'll stretch it. Sorry. I wish that people had like questions. They could just like. <laughs> oh, I'm stretch English. It's this way. All right. All right. So, what is the point of the book of Acts? What is its purpose? All right. Several hints can be gathered together to suggest Luke's purpose for writing Acts, okay? Because I, I think that uh, anytime you're interpreting something, you need to ask, why was this document being written? Why did Paul write the letter to Corinth? Why did John write the, uh, these letters to the seven churches? You know, why did Matthew Levi write this gospel to the Matthaean community? Okay? That will help us understand um, the contents of the writing. Number one, the motif of fulfillment. The verb to fulfill, um, it appears 16 times in the book of Acts, 8 times in Luke's gospel. Luke's use of this word in Acts, it actually rivals Matthew's use, who also uses it 16 times. What does Matthew use? You know, this was done to fulfill past Jesus. Well, we're constantly doing things in Matthew, and Matthew will say this was done to fulfill this passage in Isaiah 7, 14. Matthew uses it a lot. Luke uses it as many times as, as uh, in the book of Acts, as many times as Matthew. Okay, thus time, I think that's right, still the time. Time for the most uses in the New Testament. Other words of lesser frequency are used in Acts to additionally indicate the motif of fulfillment, okay? So, so Luke is trying to demonstrate that the history of the early church in some way is a fulfillment of God's purposes, okay? That's really important. We need to know that. All right, Acts chapter 1 verse 8 um, is a prediction of sorts of God's plan to be carried out through the apostles, okay? Can somebody actually read Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, please? When you will receive how when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and, on, and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to their first Okay, so you're going to receive you're going to receive power, and you're going to be my witnesses from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, and to the remotest parts of the earth, okay? So, it's a prediction of how God is going to going to have his plan carried out through the apostles. The book of Acts actually demonstrates how this plan came to pass. It starts in Jerusalem, chapters 2 through 7. It goes to Ju Judea, Samaria, chapters 8 through 11, and then to the ends of the earth from chapters 12 to 28. Okay? Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 is the summary statement of this entire book. Okay? The book of Acts is trying to tell you how the gospel went and started from Jerusalem and went to the ends of the earth. That is the purpose of the book of Acts. And so and we can see even the structure of Acts is based around this motif of fulfillment. Okay? Uh, number three, the Old Testament is cited often with the function of demonstrating its ultimate expression in the life of Jesus and his followers. Okay? So the Old Testament is used as kind of the, the thing that predicts what is coming to pass in Jesus and the followers. And we're going to see some of that today when we look in chapter 1. Um, I've got to move quickly here because uh, I want to make sure we get through all this information. But luckily, you have this stuff in front of you. You can stop and uh, you're going to have to go home and, and, and take some time to swallow this. It's a lot of stuff. Okay? All right. Number four, for purposes of X, uh, the ironic use of the Hebrew Bible. Why is it ironic? Because it's a Jewish document. It actually argues for the inclusion of Gentiles into the people of God. So Luke is trying to say this Jewish document, this kind of Jewish only document, argues for the inclusion of non Jews. There's actually some irony there, okay? And you're going to see that one of the purposes of the book of Acts is to prove this point. It's to prove the point that the Old Testament actually tells us that more than Jews are going to come into the people of God. It's not just going to be a one race thing. Number five, on the same line of thinking in regard to Jews and Gentiles, the earliest readers of Acts were likely living in a time when the church was primarily composed of Gentiles with very few Jews. This is after... Uh, uh, I don't really think there's much argument on this, um, but uh, if if Luke wrote his first volume after the destruction of the temple, which happened in what year? 70. 70. Okay. Then the book of Acts, being the second volume, we know the book of Acts was written obviously after the destruction of the temple. And so we see Jew, uh, the Jewish relations in the church, they're not as uh, friendly as we would like them to be. 
Most of the church in the book, um, in the 80s and the 90s, uh, most of the churches would be composed primarily of Gentiles. There'd be some Jews in there, but it's mostly Gentiles. Um, so they'll be the ones reading this. Yet it seems that the God of Christianity has abandoned his chosen people, the Jews. Might this God also potentially abandon the Gentiles? One might ask. Legitimate question. They're looking around the church. They're like, hey, it's 90% Gentiles, 10% Jews. God has God abandoned the Jews? What about us? We just converted from, from worshiping the emperor. We converted from worshiping uh, 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 Zeus and, and, and Asclepius to, to, to come to this Christian God. If, if God has abandoned the Jews, potentially, is he going to abandon us as well? Luke seems to write Acts with a view to, con uh, actually to confirm, excuse me, confirm and encourage Gentile converts of God's faithfulness and the reason for decreasing or for, for the decreasing number of Jew, Jewish believers in Jesus. Okay? Acts needs to confirm that God is faithful, and the reason why Jews are falling off is because of their disbelief, not because of God. Okay? That's that's something you can see in the reasoning why certain episodes are portray, portrayed the way that they are. Alright. We also see certain emphases in the book of Acts. We see that Christians in Acts are law-abiding citizens. They are not they do not threaten the political stability of the Roman Empire. Paul is regularly portrayed as a good Roman citizen. He's able to secure good treatment at the hands of a variety of Roman magistrates. When sedition is brought up, when the charge of sedition is brought up, okay, Acts is careful to draw a distinction between the apostles and the people who are actually guilty of sedition. There's a variety of passages that talk about this, okay? The point is, um, Luke, writing this in the Roman Empire, is trying to say, hey, look, Christians, they are not people that are trying to shake up the, the empire. They are not seditious people. They're not trying to revolt against Rome. In fact, the seditious people in the book of Acts are always people who are not Christians, whether it be Jews or, or, or you know, this riot uh, in Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. Um, this orderly behavior comes from the opponents of Christianity, not from the apostles. And this seems to indicate that Luke wishes to defend Christianity against the charge of being deliberately seditious or hostile to Rome. We should carefully look, well, this, this is my other point, is that we should carefully note that this does not mean that Christi the Christian message was not counter-empire. Okay? Let me say this in another way. Okay? Luke is trying to say that Christians are not deliberately trying to be hostile to Rome. That does not mean that the Christian message did not have something to say against Rome. Because when you're going around and you're saying Jesus is Lord, that basically means Caesar is not. When you're going around saying Jesus is the Son of God, that means Caesar is not. When you're saying that there's a true empire that's coming and it's going to destroy all these empires right here, the kingdom is coming, that means that the Roman Empire right now, the Pax Romana, is not all that there needs to be. Okay? Those are counter-imperial claims. Even the phrase gospel, evangelion, was first used of the Roman Emperor before Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and Jesus even came around. Okay? So their message, in a sense, is implicitly counter-empire. But I just want that, I'm not making that distinction there. Yes, sir? Would you say that the opposition, the uh, opponents of Christianity use more of a violent, physical uh, opposition rather than what the Christians did with their messages? Uh, I, I do think so, yeah. I don't think that you will find in the book of Acts Christians uh, uh, using armed resistance. I think they use a non-violent form of resistance, and I think part of the non-violent form of resistance is the preaching of the gospel. That is a resistance. By me preaching and declaring um, that Jesus is Lord and that there's another kingdom coming, or in the phrase that we see in Acts chapter 17 and verse 7, there was another king, Jesus, and that is contrary to the decrees of Caesar. That's a deliberate kind of anti-imperial book in there. But it's, it's, it's resistance, but it's it's verbal resistance. It's not armed resistance. Almost a political state. Absolutely. Okay? We live in a culture today to where you've got religion over here, and you've got politics over here, and the culture tells us never the two should come together. In the first century, you could not break the two apart. Everything religious was also political. Okay? The kingdom of God is a political and a religious entity. Jesus being the Son of God and Jesus being Lord is both a political and a religious entity. The emperor was someone who was a political figure and a religious figure. Okay? The, the, the Roman emperor was the most worshipped human being in the first century, even more than Jesus. Okay? Okay. Oh, more
more stuff. Okay, in the ancient world, the legitimacy of a religious movement was tied to its heritage and the length of time since its conception. What I mean by that is that how legitimate is your religious group? How long has it been around? Okay? Judaism could be appreciated because they could recall David. He was a famous king from a thousand years ago. Okay? Judaism even outshined Rome in this regard. Rome could only trace their history back to 700 years um, since the founding figures of Romulus and Remus. Okay? Luke, by the way, strategically argues that the early Christian movement is an extension of the established Judaic religion. Okay? And this is a likely a, a political apologetic against critics accusing it of being new. And if you're a new religion, then you must be illegitimate. Okay? See? Some people are telling Luke, oh, the Christian movement that is new, it's brand new. We know when it came around because Jesus was, was there back in the 30s. That's new, so it can't be legitimate. Luke is saying, oh, this is a Jew, an extension of Judaism. This is an extension of, 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 a, of a Jewish thing. Actually, the Christian group in the book of Acts is called a sect. And the same word that Luke uses to describe the sect.